guys. Just wanted to take a few minutes and talk about Rise of Flight United. This is a World War I flight combat simulation that's uh, available on Steam from the uh, Rise of Flight website. And uh, I just wanted to talk about it because it's a, it's a great game that seems to get a very, well, I can see in Steam, a very mixed reaction. Um, and from reading a bunch of the negative reviews on Steam and elsewhere, it basically comes down to people do not really seem to understand the game or uh, what it is. Uh, first and foremost, you'll notice how uh, when I opened the video, I said it's a World War One flight combat simulation. And it is a simulator through and through. Uh, a few of the negative reviews not talk about how you know oh well i've played uh, games like war thunder before and this one's uh you know this this or that blah 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 uh war thunder is not really a simulation uh especially if you're playing in anything other than simulator mode in war thunder it's arcade at best uh dcs that's a simulation falcon bms that's a simulation uh dangerous waters that's a simulation uh, Rise of Flight is a simulation. Uh, it's a simulator. It's not a simple game. Uh, so right off the hop, if anyone's thinking of getting into it and uh, you're looking for something very laid back and uh, easy to get into, easy to uh, control, you know, where you can just run around, shoot everything in sight, score points, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this game's not for you. If you're not willing to learn anything about airplanes or how they work, uh, this game is not for you. Uh, so yeah, there's that. It, it is a flight sim. Uh, another thing, uh, on Steam, it, it's listed under the free to play category. And that's a little unfortunate uh, because it is more of a demo that you get from it. It's not really uh, a free to play game in the same sense as uh, what people are used to. Usually in, uh, when people see free to play, they think a game that you download and you level up and progress and unlock more airplanes. And, uh, you know, in the case of War Thunder, or, uh, World of War planes or, you know, tanks and World of Tanks and likewise. Uh, so they kind of expect the same thing from Rise of Flight. Uh, and again, it is not that kind of game. Uh, what they give you for free is a few of the airplanes. And then if you want any other airplanes on top of that, uh, you pay for them from the store. Uh, now, a lot of people seem to think that's kind of scummy because they're like, oh, they nickel and dime you for all the DLC and all that stuff. Uh, but again, this is a simulator, so the airplanes you're buying are fully simulated, full cockpits, full physics. And uh, if you look at things like DCS, one airplane in DCS can cost you 60 bucks for one single airplane. Uh, you know, so if you want a whole bunch of different airplanes, uh, you know, it's going to cost you a lot of money for something like DCS. Um, and it's kind of the same idea here. Um, on Steam, there's a bunch of packs that... Uh, come with a whole bunch of different airplanes um, or if you uh, actually go to the Rise of Flight website and go under store uh, you can buy them a la carte uh, which is actually the way I recommend doing it I do not recommend doing it uh, through Steam but uh, we can talk about that a little little bit later uh, so if you're looking at actually getting into this game I'd actually not recommend the Steam client, uh, simply because the DLC off Steam is not compatible with the DLC from Rise of Flight. It's one or the other. So I'd actually recommend just uh, downloading it right from the Rise of Flight store, or the Rise of Flight website, sorry. Uh, download it from there, install it, and uh, if you do that, uh, once you install it, you'll end up with this nice little launcher window here. Uh, so I thought I'd just go through and uh, point out some of the things you kind of get for free uh, with Rise of Flight here, if you're uh, just playing the demo. Uh, so one thing you're going to have to do is, uh, once you launch the game, uh, is you'll have to create an account. Uh, if you haven't created an account, uh, this is completely independent to your Steam accounts, so whether you do this through Steam or do it uh, just through the website, it's, it's an account through the website. Uh, so you want to go create new account. Um, and just go through the registration process. It takes, uh, you know, 10 seconds and then they'll have the email to you. I did it shortly before uh, I started this video. They had the email to me in about 30 seconds. 
And then uh, you can go back into Rise of Flight. Oops. It helps if I spell my password correctly, I think. Um, and you'll want to log in online. If you don't log in online, it will not sync your account. Um, afterwards, you can go offline if you want. Um, but you want to go log in online right at first. And I'll just take a second. All right. Uh, so this is the main Rise of Flight. Uh, they call this the desktop. And uh, this is where you'll kind of launch everything through all these little menus and buttons. Uh, the interface is a little obtuse, but it's actually pretty much on par with most other flight simulators. Uh, so a few complaints I see is that you don't really get anything for the free version of the game. Uh, that's not true. They give you three aircraft uh, to start one aircraft with all of its modifications and everything else. Uh, if you click the little uh, book icon up here, that's your reference guide. And you can see the three airplanes they give you is an Albatross D5A. Uh, scroll down a bit more, there should be a Newport 17 in here. And a Spot 13. So something else I want to point out that seems to be lost on some people who are perhaps unfamiliar with simulators. Um, it's not like you start at a lower tier and then work your way up through better aircraft, etc. And the ones they give you are just kind of the starting planes. Uh, because this is a simulator and these airplanes are based on their real world counterparts, their performance and how they do in the game, aside from your own skill, is actually dependent on how the planes performed in World War I. So, uh, like I said, they give you the Spot 13 for free, and this is one of the best airplanes in the game. It was also, incidentally, one of the best uh, scout fighters in World War I. Um, you can read all about the uh, historical stuff about here, like, you know, 220 Hispano Suiza engine, uh, which actually makes a really powerful 220, was pretty on the high end for World War I. Um, I believe the spot entered service around mid, mid to late 1917 and it stayed in service throughout the rest of the war. Uh, so this here in uh, multiplayer games, a lot of people still fly the spot. Uh, it's definitely one of the uh, better fighters in the game. Uh, if we go up here, the other one they give you is a uh, Albatross D5, uh, which was a bit of a later war again, I think it was about mid, mid to late 1917. Uh, oh no, sorry, Squadrons began receiving Elytros in May 1917. Uh, so again, it's a mid to later war uh, scout. Uh, great airplane, uh, a lot of fun to fly, uh, very stable. If you're uh, new to simulator games or new to uh, uh, you know World War I and, uh, simulators and uh, biplanes, it's a great one to start with, very easy to fly. Um, I find it a little outclassed by later war Entente airplanes. Uh, but still just a, a really, really great overall aircraft. Um, and then the third one they give you is a Newport 17. Uh, so Newport 17 was a mid-war fighter. It's, uh, out of the three they give you, the, out of the spot, the Albatross, the Newport's definitely the hardest of them all to fly, and that's mostly because it's a rotary engine fighter. Um, and if you're not sure what a rotary engine was, uh, if you think a World War II radial engine, except one where the crankshaft is actually fixed to the frame and the entire engine rotates, that's a rotary engine. Uh, they were very, very small, very, very light, and developed very high power for their size, and that's why they were used. Uh, although towards the end of the war, they start to fall out of favor. Uh, but why all this is important is because a rotary engine is essentially a giant gyroscope, uh, which means you're going to start to have huge torque and gyroscope uh, effects on the airframe. And because this is a simulator, that means you're actually going to have to deal with that while you're uh, flying and fighting the simulator, uh, just like pilots in World War I did. Uh, you might have heard uh, one of the more famous fighters of World War I, the Sopwith Camel, had a very bad tendency to snap into a right-hand spin. That was because of the gyroscopic effects of its uh, very large and heavy engine and having all the weight in the very front of the airframe. Uh, so, like I said, and I, I'm going to keep hammering this point home that this game is a simulator. It's not an arcade game. It's not a simple, hey, we can just hop in and shoot some random crap. Uh, you will have to learn how to deal with all this stuff if you want to play Rise of Flight. And again, if that's not the kind of game you're looking for, then that's not the kind of game for you. 
Uh, but I digress. So back on topic. So these are the three planes they give you uh, for free in the demo of the game. And they're all fun little planes to fly. Uh, in my other account, where I've actually bought some other airplanes, uh, I still actually spend most of my time flying the new Port 17. Because uh, it's just such a fun little airplane to fly. Um, but anyway, uh, so the other thing you can do in the hangar here, or not in the hangar, in this thing, you can view other uh, paint schemes you have for the airplanes. Uh, by default, the only thing you'll have is default paint schemes. Um, all these other ones are ones uh, I've downloaded it as part of either the official skin pack, which is provided for free, or a community skin pack. So these are all different paint schemes just for the D5, uh, which is pretty cool. So anyway. Uh, so you just download the game, you got your account, you logged in. Great, now how the heck do I play this game? Uh, well, if you just want to hop in, uh, a couple of things I'd recommend first is, at the very least, take a very uh, quick overview of the options. Um, you are definitely going to have to learn how to play this game. Excuse me. Uh, you're not just going to be able to, you know, dick around and be an expert in it. It's going to take some time. Uh, they say it can be played with a mouse. Uh, it's dual control, they say. Uh, dual control to me basically means you're playing it with a HOTUS with a rudder pedal setup, or you're playing it with a good stick with throttle and twist rudder. Uh, you're not playing it with a mouse, or at least I can't see anyone playing it with a mouse and uh, actually having a lot of fun with it. Uh, whoops, I can just change something there I didn't mean to. Come on. There we go. Uh, units, metric, or imperial can change that to your own preference, obviously. Um, so, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into a lot of this stuff here. I found some of the default camera modes in this game a little annoying, so I spent some time uh, messing with how the camera moves around and snaps around. Uh, funny enough, one of the hardest aspects I found about this game is actually your situational awareness and viewing stuff. I'll talk a little more about that later. Uh, hey, look at this. This game actually supports force feedback. Too bad no one's made a force feedback joystick in like 100 years. Controls, I highly recommend, even if it's your first time, you're just getting in and you're not that familiar with simulators, at least perusing through this to find, you know, kind of what the different things actually do. Uh, you don't need to memorize them all. I mean, obviously, you know, stick left, go left, stick right, go right. Um, I wouldn't worry about most of, like, you know, Engine 1, Engine 2. Uh, stuff like Engine Start, Stop, you're going to want to know. Uh, radiator, I wouldn't worry too much about any of that stuff at first either. Uh, weapon Controls, you might want to know some of that. Uh, but like I said, just take a, at least a quick look through here so you have at least a general idea of what each of your buttons does. Uh, responses, you know, uh, I'll take a, a second and go through this now. Um, so normally uh, your joystick is what's called a linear response. That means if you look at this graph here, as I move my stick, um, it gives me a directly proportional response on the two axes. If you put in an S curve, uh, often called an S curve or an exponential response, if you'll notice towards the beginning of the movement, you can see it up here on this graph, uh, the little red thing uh, represents where my stick is, and the little bullseye there represents where the game is interpreting my uh, actual joystick movement to be. Uh, so this softens it towards the center and then makes it a lot steeper towards the edges. If you're just starting out, you may want to consider uh, using an S-curve on your roll and pitch axes. Uh, we can put an S curve on there. Um, and that'll make it a lot smoother around the center, which will make uh, things like precision gunnery uh, a lot easier for you. Um, it may make it harder, though, if you like to just bank and yank and jam the stick over. Uh, you're going to find your plane snapping in the spins very, very quickly. Um, so that'll be up to you. Oh, that's camera pitch. Definitely didn't want camera pitch. Oh. Okay, well, yeah, let's just X that. There we go. Um, so that'll be up to you. I had these programmed in actually with my joystick control software, uh, not in game. I didn't really like the ones in game. And now I've actually, uh, once I'm, now that I'm a little more familiar with the sim, I've eliminated them completely. I no longer use uh, exponential control. Uh, and you can set them up per plane too, if you so desire. 
Uh, but like I said, you'll, you'll have to play the game a bit to see uh, how you want to do that. Uh, yeah, video options, this is all blah blah blah. It's all pretty standard stuff. Audio network, yeah. So we can exit that. So you want to jump in the game and start playing. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to hit quick mission. And uh, one of the arguments I've seen too, uh, a lot of people say is like, oh, you don't get any airplanes with this game. Well, I just told you you do. Um, if you just want to do a simple uh, free flight to see what uh, the game is, I've already messed with this a bit, so it's on the default. This will be down here around 1. Uh, this will be set at like 3, and you'll probably be in like an Albatross D5 or something like that. Uh, so this here represents your altitude. I drag that up to like 2. Uh, I think that's about 2,000 meters. And uh, that'll give you a bit of height to play with. This number is how many planes are in your flight. Just drag that down to 1. 1. No, yeah. 1. And set this one over here at 0. By default, that'll be up at three. She'll be fighting against three aircraft. Just set it at zero. Now be uh, just be you, no aircraft. And then this drop down controls uh, which airplane you fly. So if you look on this thing here, all all the ones that are grayed out, you don't have. If you just scroll down a bit, you got your D5, your Newport, and your Spot. So we're gonna leave this on the Spot. Oh yeah, if you double click it, you also uh, brings up this and your different color schemes and all that. No, that's fine. So we're going to leave that on the spot. Uh, we'll go skirmish cappy, which is fine. Uh, you can leave all this stuff on the defaults. Uh, no real problem. Uh, settings here are basically going to be your uh, difficulty settings. And this is where you're going to change it from arcade mode to full-on simulator. So if you're, obviously if you're experienced with flight sims, you can probably just hit expert and be done with it. Uh, but if you're just getting into a flight sim, or if you've come from something more like War Thunder or World of Warplanes, and you think you might like this, uh, this is where you're going to find stuff to uh, make your life easier. Uh, so gameplay, show object icons, and navigation icons. These are going to show the various icons both on your map and uh, around your airplane. Um, we got kind of some mixed theories on this. Uh, a lot of people say like you know especially when you start playing hardcore simulators oh you know if you're playing a real sim you're not going to have any icons for airplanes floating in the sky blah 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 uh my argument for that uh even when i'm playing games like il2 or something on you know full everything on uh for simulator mode i still usually leave the distant icons on and the reason for that is your perspective and your awareness on a computer monitor is so far reduced from what it actually is in an airplane cockpit. Uh, it's kind of how I justify leaving those on. Um, and I can say that because uh, I am a pilot. <laughs> I do fly a small aircraft and believe me, your ability to see things in an actual airplane and your situational awareness is so far ahead of what you have in, on a uh, little computer screen. Uh, even you know if you have track IR and all that, that I actually find a decent uh, argument for leaving icons enabled. Anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, aiming help. Uh, I've never used it. I really don't recommend using it because it's you're not going to learn anything if you do. Uh, padlock. Uh, if that's internal padlock views, that's great. I'd leave it on. Um, and this actually goes up uh, back to the control thing though. Uh, this is where I highly recommend you spend some time setting up your padlock views and everything, especially if you're using a HOTUS because you're not going to be able to you know, constantly take your finger off your throttle and on your keyboard and back and uh, like most simulators, the control scheme's a little on the obtuse side, so you're going to want to make it a little easier. But but anyway, so padlock I'd leave on. Uh, simple gauges, um, I turn that off personally, but I will leave it on for now because if you're just uh, getting into this type of simulator, things like that can probably help you. Um, spectator subtitles, yeah, that's fine. Simplifications, uh, I leave all these off. Uh, if you're just even if you're just playing on easy mode, um, I'm as far as take off improved gunnery too. Uh, simplified physics. You're honestly, if you're going for simplified physics, I'd be like, really, why are you even bothering playing a flight sim? Uh, you're not going to get the huge feel for. I don't mind my parrots screaming in the background there. You're not going to get a, a huge feel for how the different airplanes fly or uh, kind of the uniqueness of the airplanes if you're on simplified physics. Uh, no wind uh, really comes into play on takeoff and landing. Uh, if you have a strong crosswind you're landing in, you're probably going to weathercock. Uh, so that gets fun to learn how to handle that. But again, I mean, that's up to you. Uh, no misfire. 
Uh, machine guns in World War I jammed a lot. Uh, so it's not uncommon when you're playing this game. Uh, you'll line up a nice perfect shot, be great, hold down the trigger, uh, your guns will fire off one round, and one or both of them will stop working. And then you gotta sit and clear the gun jam. Uh, it's a lot of fun, I think it adds a lot of tension to the game, when, especially if you're, you know, 1 versus 3 and you're trying to take stuff on your guns jam. Uh, it's great, and again, it's a you know, World War One simulation, that's uh, kind of what we're going for there. Improved gunnery, I uh, leave that off, because again, it's you're not going to really learn how to deal with a lot of this stuff if... Uh, uh, you have improved gunnery on. Uh, safety collisions, pretty self-explanatory. Invulnerability, self-explanatory, self-explanatory, self-explanatory. Uh, don't use unlimited ammo, especially. Again, you're not going to really learn anything if you do. Uh, if you start, you know, spraying and praying at, you know, half a kilometer away with uh, improved gunnery and unlimited ammo, uh, yeah, you're, you're not going to really learn how to play the game at all. Uh, these ones here where we get into a little more um, kind of, you know, depends how you want to play the game. No war, uh, no engine overflow and uh, warmed up engine. I usually leave warmed up engine on if I'm starting in the air, uh, simply because, in my opinion, your engine's already going to be warmed up because you're probably already flying for 45 minutes. Um, depending on how realistic you want to make it, you can uh, take that off and on the ground. Uh, if you're doing a scramble, it might be a little harder, and then you're going to have to manage your engine a little better. Um, these three here, so easy piloting makes it uh, easier to fly the airplanes. Again, you may or may not want to leave that on, uh, depending on if this is your first foray into a simulator. Uh, I guarantee even if, uh, like I had a lot of experience playing IL-2 uh, coming into this, and even coming into this one and uh, wings over Flanders Fields, these airplanes are hard to fly. They really are. Uh, which makes sense because when World War One broke out, airplanes had only been around for about you know 15 years or so, uh, or less. So, uh, you know, they kind of didn't really know what the heck they were doing uh, with a lot of this stuff. A lot of it was trial and error rather than actual aerodynamic research. Um, auto rudder. Even if you're playing with a lot of uh, these off, so like, you know, if you're on expert or something, auto rudder is still one you may want to leave on. And my reasoning for that is um, I find in computer flight sims, it's very difficult to actually get a feel for the rudder in uh, real small airplanes uh, where you're doing all cables and uh, stuff like that. You can really feel the resistance on the rudder. Uh, um, it's very soft near the center and then as you increase your deflection uh, you get a lot more resistance, uh, especially if you're flying like uh, gliders or a slower aircraft. They have a lot of rudder authority. So you can really feel the effects of the rudder on the pedals. You can feel it on the airplane. You can feel it when the plane starts to slip or skid. Um, and again, if you have no idea what I mean by slipping or skidding, this is a simulator, you might want to do some reading on how airplanes fly. Uh, but in a computer flight sim, especially you know when you're using rudder pedals, that, uh, like my, I'm using a CH pedals, and they just have equal all the way through, like they feel the same near the center as they do at their maximum extents. It's very hard for me to uh, gauge uh, how much rudder I have in there, whether the plane is slipping or skidding, because you can't feel it. Uh, so at least until you're really, really comfortable with the flight model in the game, you may want to consider uh, having auto rudder on. So that's what I'm actually going to turn on. And uh, this will also help you too if uh, you know you're new to World War One airplanes. Um, one thing I noticed auto rudder does do is if you snap the airplane into a spin, it automatically tries to correct the spin, uh, which is good. I was watching some videos on YouTube of people getting or uh, playing this game. And they snap an airplane into a spin, and they have no idea how to correct it. You know, they're moving the stick left and right, which is the worst thing you can do in a spin. Um, and they just spin the plane all the way into the ground. So auto rudder uh, can help you with that. So, the, so that's one uh, if you're getting started, or you know, or if you're not really interested in absolute maximum hardcore, um, you might want to leave that one on. Cruise control, I think that one's used. I haven't actually used it at all yet. I think it just keeps your speed relatively steady if you're uh, escorting uh, you know, two-seaters or bombers or something like that. Uh, autopilot. Um, so autopilot does something. I've never actually used it, so I'm not really sure what it does. Uh, I assume it's an autopilot. Might want to do some reading on that. Uh, these three here, automatic mixture, automatic radiator, automatic engine start. So most airplane engines, uh, even modern ones and small airplanes, do not have automatic mixture control. You have to manually adjust it. Uh, 
I've left these three on uh, for the most part, mainly because I'm just too lazy to actually read up on how I need to manage them, both in the game and how World War One airplanes manage them. Uh, so, for example, automatic mixture, you'd set it for full rich on takeoff, takeoff, then you'd lean it out for, uh, uh, you know, to give your uh, maximum power, you know, either lean best mixture or rich best mixture. Um, and then I imagine in combat, you'd probably shove it back to full rich, uh, but I haven't looked into that yet. So um, I just leave it on until I actually get around to doing that. Um, automatic radiator. Uh, Aircraft in World War One that were equipped with radiators, so basically anything with an inline engine, um, especially this was apparently a, an issue on the Albatross fighters, had a, a tendency to overheat. Uh, so this just automatically controls uh, your radiator uh, lovers for your cooling and things. Uh, again, if you're just starting out, uh, leave automatic radiator on. It's just one less thing for you to worry about, and it's not really going to uh, change anything. Um, and then automatic engine start, that just allows you, if you're sitting on the ground scrambling, you can just hit the E key to start the engine, at least in an inline, um, instead of, you know, having to prime the engine and uh, set your mixture and all that jazz. Um, I don't mind these ones too much because they actually really don't change how the airplane flies at all. They don't change the physics. Uh, you know, a rotary engine plane is still going to snap over really quick. Uh, these ones over here do actually change the physics of how an airplane flies, like simplified physics, easy piloting, uh, stuff like that. So. Uh, if you leave these on, uh, you're not really, um, you know, you're going to have enough to worry about and uh, just adding these later isn't going to be too difficult once you're uh, comfortable with how an air airplane functions. Uh, so once you do that, we can go start mission. And let it load. It's an Arco DH-2. Uh, two-seater, I don't know what that was, Helberstadt maybe. Uh, so this is where you'll start. Uh, one thing you might want to do is click on your hangar and uh, you can use the mouse wheel to scroll around the airplane. Uh, this is where you can customize uh, any of the modifications and stuff you have on the plane. Uh, like I said, uh, the Spot 13 has all the customizations or modifications by default. Um, so right here it's equipped with two 20 pound bombs yeah let's not do that uh let's just do this that's just ammo 769 millimeter 800 rounds each um spot is these machine guns are belt fed thankfully you're not gonna have to change the magazines uh up here uh this is kind of a nifty thing you can change your fuel load um i have no idea what a spot's full fuel load is um but if you're wondering, you know, well, why would you ever want to change your fuel load again? Remember what I said, this thing's a simulator. And these are very small, lightweight aircraft. They're uh, not very powerful. Uh, modern aviation gasoline is about six pounds a gallon. Uh, so if you figure, you know, one of these planes maybe held 20 gallons, I actually have no idea how many they hold, but fully loaded, that's, um, what, 160 pounds of fuel? 120 pounds of fuel? Something like that. Uh, yeah, 20 times 6, so it's 120 pounds of fuel. Uh, so you're adding 120 pounds, assuming a 20-gallon tank, if you have that on 100%. Uh, you will feel that difference in the game. Uh, maybe not as much with a SPOD, because it's a, a heavier airplane. If you're in something like a little Newport, you're probably going to feel that difference. Uh, gun harmonization. Uh, so this is where your guns harmonize. Uh, this here is right now set at 150 meters. Uh, so that's uh, basically where all your bullets are going to converge. Uh, paint schemes, if you have different paint schemes, again, uh, just right off install, you'll just have the default paint scheme. Uh, if we can change this, um, you know, our uh, American friends, you might want to uh, put Rickenbacker scheme on there. I'm going to go with uh, George Guinemer here. There we go. That's just more for fun than anything else. A couple of other modifications, these are some different gun sights you can put on there. I actually don't mind the default gun sights on the spot, but you can see that if I put that in there, it puts uh, that little tube gun sight in there. Uh, weapon mods, uh, any uh, weapon modification you can do, balloon guns, uh, so these are higher caliber ones, these are 11.43 millimeter machine guns, which are uh, sit somewhere between a 30 cal and a 50 cal, I think 50 cal is 12.7. Uh, so these will give you uh, more firepower, uh, less ammunition, and more weight. So you'll see here the additional weight of the mods is 58 kilograms, so it'll perform less, but you'll be a lot more deadly when you uh, hit something. Uh, if you're just starting out, you're probably not going to hit much, so go for the greater ammo. 
Uh, these are just nifty little things you can add to your plane. I like the red checkered streamers, so I leave that on. And then back to your plane description. So you go back here, hit OK. So when you're done that, you can hit start. And this will load you right into the mission. All right, so it'll always pause right off the hop. And uh, there you go. Uh, after that, you are in game. Uh, now it says intercept and destroy all enemy planes. I'm not doing that because I didn't put any enemy planes in here. Um, so like I said, this uh, spot's fairly easy to fly. Uh, if we look back here when I bank, we should see the rudder moving. Very slightly. I've already taken some time and adjusted my view control, so I have one where I can just quickly look right behind me and then snap forward. Those are on my joystick. Uh, I adjusted my thumbstick so I can look around. I can look up over my wing. And I also padlocked a view. Uh, but since there's no enemy airplanes, you're not going to see a padlock. You can see uh, down at the bottom, that's where you put your simple gauges there. You have your airspeed, uh, compass, altitude, all that jazz. If you go for more realistic gauges, you will not have any of those. Uh, the only gauges you'll have will be in your cockpit, which are right here. Uh, so you notice the plane's bumping around a bit. Um, so if I just let go of the stick, actually the spot's really stable, so you're not going to see it too much. Um, but you'll notice the plane is pitching up a bit. Uh, very few World War One aircraft had trim control. So you are going to have to manually control the direction of your plane. Sometimes you're going to have to keep pressure on the stick at all times. Uh, welcome to a simulator. Uh, other things, uh, if you're one of those players who's used to playing a more arcade flight sim where you love your bank and yank kind of gameplay, uh, if you bank and yank airplanes, it should just snap right into a spin. A uh, spot won't again because the spot's a ridiculously stable airplane. Uh, that generally will not work. Actually, if you get in any kind of turning fight with a spot, you're gonna die very, very quickly because the spot simply cannot outturn much of anything. Uh, this is an energy fighter. Uh, but anyway, so that's uh, the basic introduction to uh, Rise of Flight there. Alright, uh, so some other resources I wanted to point out. Right on the launcher menu, you'll see something here that says Useful Materials. Uh, definitely take a look at that. Uh, yeah, links to this forum thread. And hey, what do we have here? Rise of Flight Manual. Uh, yeah. Probably wouldn't hurt to have a look at it. Uh, Steam Free to Play with New Guide. This is actually a really, really good guide uh, if you're just getting into Rise of Flight. Um, goes over an absolute ton of stuff uh, that you might want to look at. Uh, if you're getting into missioning, blah, 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 all this stuff. Official mods. Uh, so this is the official skin pack. If you want more than just the default skins, this is the official one. And these are all a whole bunch of community ones, all with historical color schemes on aircraft. Uh, so you can download those and uh, gives you a whole bunch of different uh, color schemes. And again, th this is all content. You're not paying for any of this. This is all just uh, free content. It's all community stuff. Uh, fictional uh, templates if you you know brave enough to go make your own. Uh, campaign generator for doing uh, you know if you're playing a campaign or career mode. Um, just a whole bunch of other useful things. So that one is definitely worth uh, looking at. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was. Um, when it comes to buying other airplanes. Uh, so one complaint in this game, or that I've seen, you know, it's plastered all over Steam, a bunch of other places, is they nickel and dime you for all the DLC if you want to get all the planes, or, you know, or you know, when you have to get all the planes, all that jazz. Um, why would you, why, or sorry, my question is there is, you don't need all the planes. Uh, you need the ones you want to fly, and that's it. Uh, again, being a simulator, um, it's not like a game like War Thunder, something where you're progressing from, you know, I don't know, like a Fokker Eindecker all the way up to, uh, you know, a D7 or, a, you know, if they have the Schumann Shucket in here, I don't know if they have it, um, into the better ones. It's, you buy the airplanes, um, you know, that you have a desire to fly. And, uh, you know, if you really don't have, like, for example, I really have no desire to fly Fokker Eindecker in this game. Um, so I haven't bought the Fokker Eindecker. I'm not missing out on anything by not having it. I just don't fly it. Uh, it's that simple. Um, the couple I've gotten, I've uh, picked up the GBR Newport. Uh, I'll probably pick up the other Newport and its modifications. Um, 
Like I picked up the, uh, uh, not the DH4, the Bristol F2B, because it's just really, really cool. I really like that airplane. Um, I have all the albatrosses and, or albatry, whatever it is. And I think I picked up another one, but I can't remember. Um, and yeah, so one of the other complaints is, well, you know, again, they, uh, you know, the airplanes are expensive and all that jazz, you know, 998 with all its modifications, which we see in here. Uh, Twin Lewis, I highly recommend you get when you buy a plane, just buy all the modifications for it, um, unless you really don't need them. Uh, but this is the other cool thing here, right? Uh, purchase three to five items, get 25% off, six or more and get 50% off. So if you purchase three planes with all their modifications, you're getting it for 50% off. Um, just for fun, I mean, we can go see what it's going to cost to pick up, uh, you know, the rest of the Albatross aircraft with all their modifications. Uh, so that's the two Albatross, and sure, let's do a D7. Yeah, so 12 Yank Franks for, I guess it's going to again, blah, blah, blah. 12 Yank Franks for three aircraft, all their modifications. And... I mean, that gives you uh, quite a bit of content. Um, and again, you don't need all the planes. Um, like, I probably have no real intention of flying a Hanley Page 0400. So I'm probably not going to buy it. Um, actually, that's not true. I probably will eventually just because. But, but I digress. Um, the point is, is you can have tons of fun with this game, even just with the uh, free content they give you. You have the Spod 13, uh, which is one of the... <laughs> best scouts of the First World War, uh, with all its modifications they give you for free. And you can play, you can be competitive in multiplayer games uh, with that. Uh, of course, not if you don't know what you're doing, which is why you got to spend some time actually learning how to play the game. Uh, but the spot's fairly easy to play and to fly. I mean, we saw just when I was messing around with it there. Uh, in the game, it was a uh, uh, very docile, uh, fun airplane. Um, yeah, so, so don't ever feel like uh, you need to get all the DLC for this game, because you absolutely don't. Um, whoops. And uh, the reason I recommend buying it here is because, like I mentioned earlier, um, in Steam they pack everything together uh, in different airplanes. Like, I don't know, what does this one come with? Eh, I don't know. Uh, but it's not compatible. So if you buy DLC on Steam, you cannot buy DLC from the store here. Uh, so I don't recommend uh, doing it that way. All right, guys, so here I just kind of wanted to show you what I meant by uh, getting into the harder to fly, kind of more advanced, or I shouldn't say more advanced airplanes, but where the simulation aspects of this really start to come out. Uh, so here I'm in a Newport 17. Uh, this is the GBR version with uh, twin Lewis gun modification on it. Uh, so far, one of my favorite airplanes to fly in this game. Uh, but you can see already here, like, this plane, like, it will not fly straight. I take my hands off the stick, it starts to pitch, rolls a bit. Um, it is a uh, very hands-on aircraft. Um, you can also see, too, since I turned off simple gauges, um, I still have my timepiece and my compass. I could probably turn those off, too. I think I have auto rudder enabled, yeah. A lot of rudder enabled on this one for now, although I still have, you know, full independent rudder control if I want it. Um, you can see the linkages going to the ailerons there. Uh, but for example, with this plane, let's go head this direction here. Uh, you can see actually the back there, the uh, engine block spinning from the front. Uh, that's a rotary engine. That's kind of, that's how they work. Uh, so that's a giant gyroscope up front, so you're going to feel those physics. And if we go up, we should be able to just start snapping this. Yeah. So now I'm actually having trouble recovering from that because I keep snapping the plane into a stall. And uh, that engine hearing, or uh, you're hearing the engine cut out there. I'm doing what's called blipping the engine. A uh, lot of rotary engines in World War I uh, basically had two throttle settings, off and full. Uh, it's a little disingenuous. You could adjust the throttles in them. Excuse me, but it was uh, very, very difficult to do because adjusting the throttle was kind of like manually adjusting the fuel flow from the tank rather than adjusting any kind of carburetor or anything. Uh, so what they used to do was called blipping the engine, and that would either cut all the cylinder power 
or the power to half the cylinders, depending on the type of engine. And that's how you controlled your speed in these planes. Um, and in something like a little Newport here that has a really bad habit of shedding its lower wings in a dive, uh, you'll get used to using that kind of thing. But uh, this is where I said that, you know, your typical... Oh, there we go. I just snapped it into a spin. Uh, your typical banking yank gameplay, if you're used to that in War Thunder and not into a simulator, it will get you in trouble uh, in this game. Um, if you don't know what a spin is, or how to recover from it, or what's happening in a spin, uh, that's again something you may want to look up. Um, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because uh, a whole bunch of reviews uh, for this game still point out, you know, that uh, the controls for this game suck, it's too hard to fly, blah 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 blah. Uh, yeah, guys, guess what? World War One aircraft were significantly difficult to fly. Uh, put that into a bit of perspective. In World War One, the Royal Flying Corps lost around 18,000 pilots. 10,000 of those were killed in training. 8,000 were killed in combat. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, these planes are difficult to fly. If playing this game, playing it well, is going to uh, take some skill. Or, uh, or at least, well, yeah, so it'll take some skill. It's going to take some learning. Uh, but like I said, so this is the GBR version of the Newport. Um, but the uh, Russian one, you get, which is the exact same airframe, just with some different uh, equipment, uh, you do get for free in the demo version of the game. And like I said, I own a few of the other airplanes, and the Newport 17 is still one of my favorite ones to fly. It's just such a fun, little, maneuverable airplane. Okay, well that concludes my what ended up being a rather long spiel on Rise of Flight. Uh, thanks for watching the video if you made it this far. And uh, if the game looks like something you might enjoy, I highly recommend you try it. It's a lot of fun. Cheers.